Good Tuesday morning slash afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Doug Farrar, editor of the uh, Touchdown Wire site on the USA Today Sports Media Group Network. And uh, over here, this guy in the green shirt is Greg Cosell uh, of NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. And Greg, it's time for another episode of the X's and O's with Greg and Doug. And last week, we started a series on the trends that are trends and schemes and concepts that are kind of defining the modern <laughs> NFL. Um, last week we went with split safety coverage and the run pass option. This week, my friend is all about five man fronts and pre-snap motion. And I wanted to start with five man fronts. Uh, I first started noticing a bit more of the, the kind of bare front concepts a few years back. I was like just watching a Patriots game. Like, wow, Bill's putting more five man fronts up there. Um, but you know, five man fronts have a history um, and the obvious advantage, whether it's run or pass, is that it allows you to dictate single teams inside, right? When you, you put your ends on the outside shoulders of the guards and your nose tackle either over the center's head or shaded to one side, you can't really double anybody in the middle or you're going to get end up with a clogged gap. So you have that nose, the two ends, the two edge backers. Um, just your thoughts overall on the five-man front and it's increasing, and at least from what I've seen, it's, it's increasing – prevalence in today's NFL. Yeah, I really started to notice it, Doug, a number of years back, mostly in passing situations, you know, third down, long yardage, uh, because defenses wanted to be able to get those one-on-one matchups that you suggested, uh, because when you have a five-man front and you pretty much cover each offensive lineman for the most part, you're pretty much dictating one-on-one pass protection. Uh, And that's when I really start to notice it because what teams would do uh, is they, they take a very good pass rusher uh, and maybe they bring him inside and they put him over a guard or they bring him over the center and you'd get a very good pass rusher against a guard or a center. And, and not to be funny or sarcastic, but guards and centers space is not their friend. So you, you don't really, they're kind of stuck at times when they're facing, you know, quick, agile pass rushers who really are defensive ends who then come inside. So it would be advantage for the defense because they'd get those one-on-one matchups with really good pass rushers. Look, you can almost go back to the Giants versus the Patriots in that Super Bowl when the Giants brought J- Justin Tuck inside. Yes. And, you know, at that time they started, they called it what the NASCAR front or the yes. cheetah front teams have different names for it, but you'd essentially play with either three uh, defensive ends or even four defensive ends. So the next step in that was the five man front where you cover every offensive lineman and you pretty much force them to have to block one on one. But now we've seen the evolution even further where it's not just used in third down or, or passing situations where it's used pretty much as foundational fronts for a lot of teams that line up with five man fronts. Would you call it base at this point for some teams? I know, I mean, the Eagles use it a lot. Yep. The- Commanders, um, well, we'll get into 515. The commanders use 515 a ton. And when you have their linemen, I guess you would. Uh, the Saints did some interesting things. The Raiders used it a lot last year. So it is becoming more of a thing. And for yep. some, I think it is kind of a base concept. Without question. I mean, there's a lot of teams now whose base fronts, if they're facing base personnel on offense, their base front is a 5 2. You know, we used to, in a sense, we'd call it a 3-4. To me, it's more of a 5-2. That's the way I kind of see it, because what you're seeing now is a lot of 5-2 fronts reduced. In other words, you have uh, you have two ends, obviously. Then you have two D tackles who are essentially three techniques lining up uh, just outside the guard. And then you have a, a zero technique or a nose right over the offensive center. Um, it's difficult to run against that kind of front, you know, as a base front. Um, uh, because when you have two, three techniques, that's hard because a lot of your, let's say gap scheme runs where you pull a guard. Uh, sometimes that's difficult to do when you have two, three techniques because you're basically pulling a guard away from a three technique who can immediately penetrate and it makes it a little more difficult. And also even in the zone run game, it, it if it's not gap scheme, but it's zone, you have to really deal with that front and you don't get to the second level quite as quickly. And therefore you allow the linebackers to be able to, to play off what they see in front of them and be quicker in their reaction time in their key and diagnose. So, you know, it's become a base front for a lot of teams in the league. 
One one thing I noticed is that you're talking about the zone and just you know slide and getting up to the second level and all that. If you have to then cut back, you're in big trouble against a five man front because that guy has gotten in because you're all going this way. That guy either either the backside edge backer or maybe a safety's playing down. Uh, you know uh, he's hanging. He's like a force concept. If you cut back, it's like uh oh, I got a brick wall here. Yeah. Um, now, the only thing is, if you're going to play, and you mentioned the 5-1, which a lot of teams, you know, play is their nickel, a 5-1. Um, the one thing about that, if you can get past the first level, if you can cut back, um, there's only one second level defender in that front. Right. You know, it's a 5-1. So one issue with that is there's really no cutback second level defender. So unless, you know, because obviously we're talking about a 5-1, we're not talking about a safety in the box. We're talking about a 5-1 front where there's only one second-level defender, and that's a linebacker. Now, safeties can obviously fill, but they're not aligned in the box. So there's no second-level cutback player defensively. And if you can get past that first level with a with a really, you know, nice cutback by your back, that can pose some problems for the defense in a 5-1. If it's a straight 5-2 and, you know, we see uh, – we, we see anything sort of becoming more common in the NFL, we automatically think, okay, how do you beat it? So how do you, what are the best ways to sort of, okay, we're playing a team that's going to run, you know, 40, 50, 60% of their stuff in a, in that five man front. How do you attack it? Well, in an ideal world, you want to attack it with the pass because keep in mind that usually in a five, two front, you're not playing man coverage. So now you have, you have defenders who are flat defenders, okay, in, in zone coverage, who are on the line of scrimmage. It's harder for them to get any depth, uh, the same amount of depth as it, as if they're off the ball defenders. So you can attack it with a pass. Think about a concept that is in everybody's playbook. We call it flood or three-level stretch, where you run three routes at a, at the, a deep level, an intermediate level, and a short level to the same side of the field. And now you're asking that that flat defender who's on the line of scrimmage to be able to get underneath an intermediate route, which is really difficult. That's yeah. hard to do. He's got a lot of area to cover. So you really want to attack it. Obviously, if you can protect, I mean, that's the main factor with any part, any passing game, but if you can protect it, you really want to attack it by throwing the football. Throwing the football is good. Well, let's get to our uh, second concept for today. Throwing the throwing the football pre-snap motion. And it's, I think it's more of a thing in today's NFL than it ever has been, but it's not new. I mean, Sid Gilman used it. I got to watch tape with Joe Montana a couple of years ago, and we brought up the game-winning pass to John Taylor in Super Bowl XXIII. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Rice went in motion to sort of, you know, to get that, you know, now you got two – alphas on this side of the field and one of them was going to be open and montana it was a what, red right tight f left 20 half back curl x up for all you geeks out there but montana would talk about not, not only how he would how walsh would bill walsh would use that just a cross motion to give a you know not, joe montana doesn't need a zone tell but it was to set the bengals up to have to use split safeties to to sort of dictate to the defense what they were going to do. And I remember talking to Dan Orlovsky about motion a couple of years ago. And he said, yeah, motion to indicate manner zone or whatever is kind of the first level. Really now it's about motion to disrupt. <coughs> yeah. To make, well, to put a defense in a situation it doesn't want to be in. Yeah. Years ago, we always used to think of motion <clears throat> as um, it would give you a zone or man tell. In other words, if you took a receiver and motioned him across the formation, from one side of the formation to the other, Doug, the feeling was, hey, if somebody ran with him, you know, let's say a corner ran with him, that would be a man-to-man -man tell because that was his man matchup and he had to run with him. That is not always the case right now. Um, uh, obviously, if, if he didn't run with him, people would say it's zone because he's staying right. where he is, so it's zone coverage. That was really the early simplest thing, as, as Dan Orlovsky said. But it's, it's advanced way beyond that. And and plus, defenses have gotten smarter, too, as you know. Yes. A lot of times they might run someone across the formation, but it and doesn't always mean it's man coverage. Like you know, I, saw, I first saw the commanders do that a couple of years ago where they ran a guy across and it was, uh, oh, okay. They're, they're stuck Because defensive coaches are smart, too. And like, oh, okay, we, we, this is our tendency, so we'll break it. 
Yeah, and keep one thing in mind. If you're playing with three wide receivers, okay, on offense, let's say you're in what we call 11 personnel, one back, one tight end, three wide receivers. If you take your slot receiver, okay, and you motion him across the formation, very often the defense will take their slot corner and and bring him with him, which doesn't automatically mean man. They need to stay from a numbers perspective to match up to what the the offensive formation has now become. So they bring their slot corner to the same side as the slot receiver, which automatically does not mean man coverage. So, you know, but, but the point is, is defenses have gotten smarter. So it's not just a case of, okay, it's man or zone just because you motion across the formation and there's multiple kinds of motions. As we know, there's what we call return motion. We'll get to that in a minute, but return motion is where you start a guy in motion and he just starts toward the, the interior of the formation, but then returns back outside. But let's, let's simplify it this way. The more the offense motions before the snap, the more theoretically the defense has to communicate. So it puts some pressure on their defensive calls, you know, they, and their checks because rarely, rarely does a defense do nothing in response to motion. You do see that on occasion. And that depends on what the defense is in. We talked last week about cover four and very often in cover four quarters coverage, You don't have to change the passing strength of your coverage because it's basically a four across umbrella coverage. So you don't necessarily need to to move people. But more often than not, there has to be some kind of of check or change in your call. Um, So what happens if a team plays, if you're a defense playing a team like the Niners, like the uh, Dolphins, like the Chiefs, um, these are teams that are heavy motion teams. What happens is defensive coordinators tighten up their play calls. They don't do as much because the more you have to communicate, the more you have to check, the more likely it is that one guy might not get it exactly right. And that can cause a problem for your defense. So the way a lot of coaches talk about it is motion regulates the defense because it limits what they do with their calls and their checks. I'm going to give you, yeah, I'm going to give you a few numbers. So pre-snap motion last season, quarterbacks completed 65.4% of their passes, uh, 327 touchdowns, 155 interceptions, pass rating of 91.74. Without it, uh, 70.6 uh, or 7.6 yards per attempt, 423 touchdowns, 263 interceptions, pass rating of 87.29. The touchdown to interception rate with, with pre-snap motion, it was 4.5. Uh, touchdown rate, 2.1 interception rate, 3.9 touchdown rate, 2.4 interception rate without. So generally speaking, it helps. The one exception to that, because we talked about quarters versus motion, you and I did yesterday, and I looked it up. There were 33, 34 touchdowns with pre-snap motion against quarters last season, 33 interceptions. That It was that it seemed like, and I was watching some of the plays, it seemed like that where you don't have to change the passing strength and, and yep. maybe – one gets out of assignment and out of alignment because that can happen real easy and real quick right before the snap of the ball. It seems like that not, again, we don't use the word blueprint, but it is an architecture to not defeat pre-snap motion and well, iterations, but it helps. Yeah. Because, well, because what motion does, and, and again, there's, there's many reasons, but motion changes the strength of the offensive formation if it's motion across the formation. And therefore, it can often change how the defense has to react. And as we said, that can create some communication problems. Um, now, everybody thinks about motion in the pass game. Uh, and by the way, as we said, motion does not have to be across the formation. Sometimes it can be return motion. But it also is impactful in the run game as well because it can create better blocking angles. And that's what you're trying to do. I mean, you know, there's not a thousand different kinds of runs. So ultimately what you're trying to do is create advantageous blocking angles and leverage angles for your, your, your blockers, whether it's your O-line, whether it's wide receivers, whether it's a tight end, whoever it may be that goes in motion, you're trying to create advantageous angles and that helps in your run game quite a bit. It's a really important point. And, you know, we can point to Kyle Shanahan as the guy who I think yep. uses best and there was a 60 i we were talking on the phone this morning tuesday morning and i brought up the 68 yard run against the seahawks in the play yeah uh christian mccaffrey where kyle use uh shifted we should 
real quick the difference between shifts and motion. A shift, yeah, the difference between a shift and a motion is a shift is when a player moves and then resets. Okay. Uh, a motion is where a player moves and the ball snapped while he's moving. That's motion. So right. that's the difference between a shift and motion. But I remember very well the player speaking about, and what they did is they started out in a three by one set. Okay. Use check shifted across the formation and made it a two by two set. And then all they did was run one of their basic zone runs, but they brought Kittle in motion before the snap of the ball and he became a lead blocker so it was simply a zone lead run which is in everybody's playbook but they got to it a little bit differently and Kittle became the lead blocker often you'll see a zone lead run with let's say the I formation you know that's how a lot of teams run zone lead because they're in the I formation the straight I and they have a fullback right in front of the the tailback and the quarterback's under center, and it's a zone lead. Well, the Niners got to it differently, but it was simply a zone run, and they used Kittle in motion across the formation, um, and he became the lead blocker. Now, it turned out he didn't really need to make a great block because he was going to get the corner, and the corner you know, stayed outside. Uh, right. But it really set up beautiful blocking angles because um, uh, – the safety on that particular play because the Seahawks were in a, a too deep shell. The safety stayed deep and I, Brandon, I, the wide receiver really didn't have to make a difficult block and it became a 68 yard run, but a great example of using motion in the run game, which the Niners do exceptionally well. Um, I think that the dolphins with Mike McDaniel will try to do that a yes. lot because Mike McDaniel came from the Niners and he's definitely a savant when it comes to the zone run game. Um, so, you know, you, you'll see more and more of that. The, the Niners are masters of it. Well, and you brought up this a couple weeks ago, we were talking about just the run game in general and, you know, having merging the run game in the pass game. And you talked about, and it's certainly obvious on tape, how uh, the 49ers brilliantly keep you guessing. It's like, and they, cause they pass on a 21 personnel too. So Ryan Neal up here, he can't really completely commit to the bit because Brock Purdy may still hit someone yep. to the side. And, you know, and the other, another thing with motion, by the way, just as we keep advancing the point is what do we talk about all the time with defenders that they have to play with good eyes, right? You know, that's really important for defenders to play with their eyes effectively. Um, and what happens a lot with motion is it kind of messes with the eyes of defenders. We see that all the time with that jet action across the formation is defenders get caught up because there's somebody moving at with speed across the formation and somebody takes one or two steps to react to it because it's just, it's human nature very often. You know, it, it's always easy to say don't react, but when you see someone like, let's say Tyree kill or someone yeah. along those lines, you know, going across the formation with jet action, you know, you tend to react to it and you end up playing with bad eyes and all it yep. takes is one or two steps in the wrong direction in the NFL. And that poses a problem. So you're trying to get defenders to play with bad eyes. And it happens a lot on tape. You know, you always think when I watch that, I always think of Bill Belichick saying, do your job, but it's mm -hmm. hard because yep. there's just a lot going on and you react to it. Well, as a defender, you're thinking in your head, okay, do my job, but I have three jobs here because I don't know what they're doing and they're camouflaging it so well. Correct. And doing, yeah. And it, like Sean McVay with the Rams, he has been spamming people with that, uh, the fast jet run game for years. It's just, you know, it's become a thing. No question. So, I mean, you know, motion is obviously, um, you know, a really good thing to do. Now keep one thing in mind. Don't forget defenses do move when there's motion. Okay. Right. So not every quarterback loves that because a lot of quarterbacks like the, to have the ball being snapped where everybody is where they were before the snap of the ball, because mm -hmm. don't forget when the defense moves, that can also change some things with the defense We're you know, we're always assuming it's bad for the defense, but if the quarterback feels like he's uncertain, if it's a pass play, that is obviously, and that he's uncertain what that defensive movement is going to result in, you know, it could be disguise late movement. And if your quarterback's uncomfortable with that, then you don't want to do motion because the last thing you want is your quarterback dropping back and, and being uncertain and hesitant and tentative in, in being able to process what he's seeing. 
So, you know, we always assume motion's great because the numbers in, for certain teams are, are, are really wonderful. They're really good. But, you know, some quarterbacks want the defense to be, hey, I'm going to snap the ball. They're, they're exactly where I know they're going to be. Well, it's in, you know, we talk about the Pantheon. I mean, Peyton Manning famously yep. didn't want it. And Tom Brady, and there's no way he didn't love motion because, you know, they used it a ton with the Patriots, and then he went to the Buccaneers. There's like a, a half a season where Bruce Arians, uh, Peyton didn't need it. Why does Tom need it? And then all of a sudden they started using a lot more of it. And with Brady, it was, okay, I'm going to play spot the Huckleberry over here because someone's going to someone's gonna miss when we do, you know, one of these things. Right. Um, so it's it's interesting how different – I mean, Manning and Brady might be one and two, however you want to do it, greatest quarterbacks of all time. They see it completely differently as far as the canvas in front of them and, and, and what they no, want to see. Peyton didn't want anybody to move. He wanted Marvin on the right, Reggie on the left, and boom, that's how we were going to play. And I know where the defense is going to be, and I can figure out the defense, which he could. And, yeah. you know, that's what he wanted. And I have a, you know <laughs> – I have Reggie and Marvin and Dallas Clark and Edger and James, and I can. I'm Peyton Manning. I can. I can get I'm team. okay with that. You know, I yeah, know what the defense is going to do now. That's pretty decent. Uh, I want to finish uh, this week's episode with uh, two plays, and we'll put up the McCaffrey run and these two plays from the uh, last year's Super Bowl. Um, these are plays that basically won it for the Chiefs. It, yeah. Andy, Andy Reid famously called it corn dog, and it was one to the right and one to the left. Um, and it was return motion both ways. And I, we discussed this this morning, too. And I, I found a Nick Sirianni quote where he was saying, OK, they got us here and they got us there. We also played return motion well a lot last year. So on these plays where, you know, again, it's that as you talked about, it's you think you're going across and then you, you sharply turn. And in both cases, the cornerback's like, OK, well, that's the what do I do now thing. Well, I love the touchdown to Kadarius Tony. That was the first, the first one yeah. because, because Tony was split to the right. Okay. He was number one to the right and he started to go in motion as if he would go across the formation. And what made this play really fun to look at was the Eagles clearly had a plan for that because yep. Dar Darius Slay was lined up over Tony. And on this particular play, because it was a low red zone, meaning inside the 10 yard line on this particular play, Gardner Johnson was the, was the post safety. So the Eagles had a plan, Doug. What they wanted to do was as soon as Tony went in motion, because they anticipated being across the formation, because the Chiefs do that a lot in the low red zone, is Slay and Gardner Johnson were going to switch responsibilities. And you could see Slay actually communicate with Gardner Johnson and say, hey, in so many words, he didn't use all these words, but what he's saying is, hey, he's going across the formation now. You run with him from your post safety position, and I'll replace you as the post safety. So what Slade yeah, did – Yeah, about one and, – and we'll put these plays up too. About one second after Tony starts his motion, you can see clearly Slade is waving. To right, because that was – they, they had practiced this. That, that wasn't done on a whim. They had practiced this, okay? Yeah. So what happened is Slay, because he just assumed, okay, Tony's going across the formation, he took his eyes off Tony because he figured, I'm just going to the deep safety position now, okay? And then Tony immediately went in return motion, meaning he came right back where he started, and Slay, because he took his eyes off of him, did not see him. And therefore, Mahomes just threw it to Slay. It was an easy pitch and catch, uh, and Tony just walked into the end zone. So that was a beautiful job by the Chiefs of countering what they anticipated the Eagles doing because the Chiefs had used that across the formation motion so foundationally throughout the season in the low red zone. Yep. And that play after the extra point tied at 27 27. And we know what happened then. <laughs> we had the, uh, the Sky Moore play to the other side. <laughs> yeah. And that one was just a case where Avanti Maddox, the slot corner, just kind of, you know, he just, again, assumed that Sky Moore would go across the formation and he started to run across the formation and just took his eyes off Sky Moore totally. And Moore, of course, went in return motion back to where he came from, which was on the left side of the formation on that play. And that, again, that was an easy touchdown. But the first one to Tony was, to me, really interesting because the Eagles clearly had a plan that they practiced and the Chiefs had countered it really nicely. And, you know, yeah. one of the things when you get to the Super Bowl is teams bring in every scout, every personnel guy, and they just grind away. You know, 
some scout, you know, might have been given the assignment of research every Eagles play this year in the low red zone, every Eagles defensive play and how they handle every particular you know, situation, every, you know, every motion, every this, every that. And that's how they discover what a team's tendency is. And then they play off the tendency. It probably wasn't Andy Reid banging Exos at three in the morning going, oh, that's what no. they do. I, I mean, it could have been Andy, but it didn't necessarily have to be Andy. Yeah. Do you think, in, in, to, to finish, I mean, uh, Roethlisberger, Ben Roethlisberger famously didn't like it. I don't think, I've read that Matthew Stafford doesn't like it. Do you think if you're, anti pre snap motion as a quarterback in the NFL today you're playing at a disadvantage? Um, you know, I think that's a philosophy, Doug. I'd hate to say you're playing at a disadvantage because I think, you know, you can still be good without motion. Oh, um, of course. Yeah. So, no, I, I wouldn't word it that way because, you know, just doing this for a long time and speaking to a lot of people – and there's many, many ways to do things in the NFL. There's many, many ways to be successful. You know, motion always looks cool. I mean, when you see the Niners do it and, and cool plays result, you think, wow, everybody should just do that because it looks so great. But, you know, that's just an aesthetic as opposed to a, a tactical philosophy. There's many different philosophies, and I don't think that you're at a disadvantage. No, I, I wouldn't use that word. Yeah, there are also lesser quarterbacks I've seen who motion gums them. It's like it's supposed to confuse the defense, but if you don't really have the playbook in your head, it'll confuse you too. Like, well, what's that guy's doing? Well, well that's like, my point about some quarterbacks. You know, it, it, you know, defenses do tend to move. It's one reason why a lot of quarterbacks don't like play action to turn their back to the defense right. because when they snap their head around, the defense is not in the same spot as it was before they they turn their head, and it, you know, it, it takes then you have to sort of see it again. Some guys have no problem with that. Other guys, it, it screws them up. Yeah. And the supposed schematic, uh, you know, advantage to use that word again is gone. You've right. negated it because it's, it's just not in your head. Well, Greg, uh, thank you as always for great stuff. You're one guy who's never confused by pre-snap motion. We know this. And, uh, <laughs> I'm confused by other things. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> great stuff as always. And we'll talk again next week. All right. Thanks. <laughs>